Welcome back to the Dark Eye. This is the Phantom Safety Pin. And we're about to begin a bonus nightmare, so... Yeah, bonus nightmare, so... I hope you, uh, sit back and relax and... This one's a, this one's a long one, so... Sit back, relax, and enjoy... The Mask of the Red Death. Tripod, 
bearing a brazier fire. This projected its rays through the tinted glass and so glaringly illumined the room. And thus were produced a multitude of gaudy and fantastic appearances. But in the western or black chamber, the effect to the firelight that streamed upon the dark hangings through the blood-tinted panes was ghastly in the extreme. It produced so wild a look upon the countenances of those who entered that there were few of the company bold enough to set foot within its precincts at all. It was in this apartment also that there stood against the western wall a gigantic clock of ebony. Its pendulum swung to and fro with a dull, heavy, monotonous clang. And when the minute hand made the circuit of the face, the hour was to be stricken, there came from the brazen lungs of the clock a sound which was clear and loud and deep and exceedingly musical, but of so peculiar a note and emphasis that at each lapse of an hour, the musicians of the orchestra were constrained to pause in their performance to hearken to the sound. And thus the waltzers perforce ceased their evolutions, and there was a brief disconcert of the whole company. As well, the chimes of the clock yet rang, it was observed that the giddiest grew pale, and the more aged and sedate passed their hands over their brows, as if in confused reverie or meditation. But when the echoes had fully ceased, a light laughter at once pervaded the assembly. The musicians looked at each other and smiled, as if at their own nervousness and folly, and made whispering vows each to the other, the next chiming of the clock would produce in them no similar emotion. And then, after the lapse of 60 minutes, there came yet another chiming of the clock, and there were the same disconcert and tremulousness and meditation as before. But in spite of these things, it was a magnificent room. The tastes of the Duke were peculiar. He had a fine eye for color and effects. He disregarded the decor of mere fashion. His plans were bold and fiery, and his conception glowed with barbaric luster. There are some who would have thought him mad. His followers felt that he was not. It was necessary to hear and see and touch him to be sure that he was not. He had directed in great part the embellishments of the seven chambers upon occasion of this great fete. And it was his guiding taste which had given character to the masqueraders. He sure they were grotesque. There was much glare and glitter and piquancy and phantasm. There were arabesque figures with unsuited limbs and appointments. There were delirious fancies such as the madman fashions. There was much of the beautiful, much of the wanton, much of the bizarre, something of the terrible, and not a little of that which might have excited disgust. To and fro in the seven chambers there stalked a multitude of dreams, and these, the dreams, right in and about, taking you from the rooms, and causing the wild music of the orchestra to be seen as the echo of their steps. Until at length there commenced the sounding of midnight upon the clock, and then the music ceased as I have told, and the evolutions of the waltzers were quieted, and there was an uneasy cessation of all things as before. But now there were twelve strokes to be sounded by the bell of the clock. And as it happened, perhaps, that more of thought crept with more of time into the meditations of the thoughtful among those who reveled. And thus do it happen, perhaps, that before the last echoes of the last chime had utterly sunk into silence, there were many individuals in the crowd 
with our leisure to become aware of the presence of a masked figure. The rumor of the new presence having spread itself whisperingly around, there arose at length from the whole company a buzz or murmur expressive of disapprobation and surprise. Then, finally, of terror, of horror, and of disgust. In an assembly of phantasms such as I have painted, it may well be supposed that no ordinary appearance could have created such sensation. In truth, the masquerade license of the night was nearly unlimited. But the figure in question had out Heroded Herod and gone beyond the bounds of even the prince's indefinite decorum. There are chords in the hearts of the most reckless which cannot be touched without emotion. Even with the utterly lost, to whom life and death are equally jests, there are matters of which no jest can be made. The whole company, indeed, seem now deeply to feel that in the costume and bearing of the stranger, neither wit nor propriety existed. The figure was tall and gaunt, shrouded from head to foot in the habiliments of the grave. The mask which concealed the visage was made so nearly to resemble the countenance of a stiffened corpse that the closest scrutiny must have had difficulty in detecting the cheat. And yet all of this might have been endured if not approved by the mad revelers around. But the mummer had gone so far as to assume the type of the Red Death. His vesture was dabbled in blood, and his broad brow was all the features of his face that was besprinkled with a scarlet horror. When the eyes of Prince Prospero fell upon this spectral image, which with a slow and solemn movement, as if more fully to sustain its role, stalked to and fro among the waltzes, he was seen to be convulsed with a strong shudder, either of terror or distaste, whereupon his brow reddened with rage. Who dares, he demanded harshly of his courtiers who stood near him, who dares insult us with this blasphemous mockery? Seize him and unmask him, that we may know whom we have to hang at sunrise on the battlements. And in the eastern or blue chamber, in which stood the Prince Prospero as he uttered these words. They rang throughout the seven rooms loudly and clearly, for the Prince was a bold and robust man, and the music had become hushed at the waving of his hand. At first, as he spoke, there was a slight rushing movement of pale courtiers in the direction of the intruder, who, at the moment, was also near at hand. And now, with deliberate and stately step, made closer approach to the speaker. But from a certain nameless awe with which the mad assumptions of the mummer had inspired the whole party, there were found none who put forth hand to seize him. So that, unimpeded, he passed within a yard of the prince's person. While the vast assembly, as if with one impulse, shrank from the centers of the rooms to the walls, he made his way uninterruptedly. But with the same solemn and measured step, through the blue chamber to the purple, through the purple to the green, through the green to the orange, through this again to the white, and even thence to the violet, very decided movement had been made to arrest him. It was then, however, that the Prince Prospero, maddening with rage and the shame of his own momentary cowardice, rushed hurriedly through the six chambers, while none followed him on account of the deadly terror that had seized upon all. Four aloft a drawn dagger and had approached in rapid impetuosity to within three or four feet of the retreating figure. When the latter, having attained the extremity of the velvet apartment, turned suddenly and confronted his pursuer. There was a sharp cry, and the dagger dropped gleaming upon the sable carpet, upon which 
Instantly afterwards fell prostrate in death the Prince Prospero. Then, summoning the wild courage of despair, a throng of the revelers at once threw themselves into the black apartment. And seizing the mummer, whose tall figure stood erect and motionless within the shadow of the ebony clock, gasped in unutterable horror at finding the grave cerements and the corpse-like mask which they held us so violent a rudeness, untenanted by any tangible form. Now was acknowledged the presence of the Red Death. He had come like a thief in the night, and one by one dropped the revelers in the blood bedewed halls of their revel, and died each in the despairing posture of his fall. The light of the ebony clock went out with the last of the game, and the flames of the tripods expired, and darkness, decay, and the red death held illimitable dominion over all. Now that was a crazy dream, guys, and a very long dream, so, well, I think that's enough dreaming for just yet. We're not out of the woods yet, though. Until next time, it's the Phantom Safety Pin, and hopefully you guys don't die from some horrible disease. If you do, I guess you're going to miss the rest of the story. Bye!